Testing, testing. Still way too loud. Can you get Jamie? Can you please come get Ellie? Okay, let's try this again. You're listening to The Neurodivergent Nurse, and I'm your host, Jamie. I'm a registered nurse who has ADHD. On this podcast, we will talk all things ADHD. I'm really just beginning to learn about this diagnosis and how to navigate through it, but I am so excited to take you on this messy and raw journey with me so that we can learn together. So let's get started. Welcome to this episode of The Neurodivergent Nurse. I'm so excited about you getting to listen to this interview with the host's co-host. Well, host with an S on it, plural. There's two of them. There's Katie and Garrett, and they talk about having ADHD, their journey with getting diagnosed, as well as how they came about doing a podcast that's also about ADHD. The name of that, because you're going to want to go check it out, is The Bar is Ankle High. Also, at the end of the episode, they give some great tips on what to do if you want to start your own podcast, or if there's something that you really want to do, but you're a bit fearful about it because of your ADHD, or whatever reason. Stick around, listen to those tips, and I hope you love them as much as I did. We met four years ago by happenstance. I started working at the same agency that Garrett was already working at, and my desk was just across from hers. And like different departments doing different things, completely separate, just happened to get put next to each other. Yeah. And Katie said something funny, and I was like, eh. <laughs> And that was kind of it. Neither yeah. of us need much encouragement, apparently. <laughs> no, but I do think that we saw ourselves in each other mm-hmm. a bit. And during COVID, especially, because I had only worked there just over a year when mm-hmm. lockdown started and we were completely sent home. But I think during COVID, we got much closer mm-hmm. just because I needed somebody to talk to about yes. work. And and I was whatever. not like mental health was bad at that point. So yeah, I think it was, it was good. Extra anxious. Oh but, yeah. yeah. I was struggling for sure. Um, so we just got closer during COVID. And once we started going back to the office, we've had many conversations about mental health. It had turned into conversations about ADHD. And I had mentioned, you know, I, I saw you know, one of the podcasters I listened to mention that they had asked for, it was like a true crime podcast. And one of the hosts was discussing that they had asked for an evaluation because they saw a TikTok or something and they were like, that sounds like me. That sounds like what I struggle with. I don't really sleep at night. I sleep during the day or I have a really hard time getting up early and I have these hyper fixations that I will spend thousands of dollars on without regard to maybe I need money for groceries later. And so they were discussing that and I had mentioned it to Garrett and then through a kind of weird series of events. I ended up going back to therapy. I basically got a phone call one day from a therapist saying, hey, are you ready to talk? And I was like, I don't know you. (laughs) And I guess somebody in the area has the same name as me without an apostrophe and almost the same birthday. Wow. I had already gone to this practice in the past and they just mix it up. So that therapist called me thinking I was her patient. So I was like, oh, maybe the universe is just telling me to go back to therapy. At first we were like, that's weird. And then a few days later, you know, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe I'll just do a checkup and make sure everything's okay. Yeah. And, um, and I so think I, I had just started going back to therapy at that point too. I think so. Yeah. So like I was back in that, in that space, which I think helps. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, do a little mental health checkup and see how that is. So I started going and I had asked her about it and she agreed, but said like, well, I can't diagnose you. You have to go to your MD. So I went to my MD and I got diagnosed that way. And once I got diagnosed and we had already had discussions about ADHD at that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay, podcast listeners, I'm going to press pause on Katie and Garrett talking about their stories with ADHD, and we are just going to have a little chat real quick about ADHD in women. If you didn't realize it, research shows that women are highly motivated to hide their ADHD symptoms and compensate for them. What that means is that the symptoms that are most observable are often anxiety or mood related, which can lead to a misdiagnosis. Garrett, like many girls, wasn't diagnosed with ADHD in childhood. She was diagnosed when she was in her late 20s. However, she did take an abnormal psych class in high school and realized that she had a lot of the anxiety symptoms. So she did get evaluated for that. Later, she decided to go off of her medications for it because she was gonna have it forever. So might as well learn skills to manage it outside of pharmaceuticals. Now, we're gonna get back to her story. 
you know, what am I going to do about it? It is what it is. I think my anxiety was so much more of a problem for me that mm. I just really, really wasn't thinking about the ADHD until, <laughs> until Katie started talking about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do that too. Oh, yeah, yep, yep, I also do that. <laughs> right. So then it became very validating yeah. to have a friend who was like, oh, no, that's for sure something that I do. That's, yeah, no, I, I have the reason I take walks every two hours at work is because otherwise I go nuts and get really stir crazy and mm -hmm. can't focus. And the one thing that really stuck out to me, <laughs> we were talking about going to the bathroom and like not going, like refusing to go yes. to the bathroom so that you could like finish whatever it was you were working on. Yep. And then you end up like practically lo losing control of your bladder when you finally do get to the toilet. And there's no reason. Ridiculous. Like, nothing that we do is urgent. Right. <laughs> ever. Nope. <laughs> I can wait to print out envelopes for something. <laughs> the two and a half minutes it takes me to go to the bathroom and wash my hands. And yet here yeah. I am refusing to do that because it's like that thing of like, well, I can't stop because then I'll lose momentum. I, I can't risk yep. getting distracted by something else. Or I'll forget. Or I'll be like, I got to pee. I'm like, yeah, I should do that. And then I start working on something else and just completely forget about it until I'm like, oh my God, I got to go. Yeah, I forget about it until there's a rapid or a code that goes off. I'll be sitting there <laughs> yes. charting. I'm like, man, I really need to go to the bathroom, but let me finish charting this hour long code I was just on. And then, you know, 20 minutes goes by, I'm still in this chart doing the stuff. And then I hear code blue go off. And I was like, man, I really should have gone by the bathroom because who knows <laughs> how long I'm going to be right. stuck now. Yes, exactly. I've done that before too, leaving work. I live seven minutes from our office and I've had to go to the bathroom before I leave work because I can't trust myself to walk to my car and sit in my car. <laughs> I can't mm -hmm. be trusted. I just, I'd rather just pee and know that if there's traffic or something, I'm not then sitting there daydreaming about going pee, which is a or weird. having to make a really bad choice with that Gatorade bottle. This <laughs> is your car and yes, your female. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So once I started really kind of digesting my diagnosis, we had had a lot more discussions about it. And I got diagnosed last February. So in the end of March, I really started thinking about a lot of our conversations really come back to the idea of that feeling of now that I have a, a diagnosis and a name to put to the problem, I keep seeing, oh, that's what my ADHD was. Oh, it was because of my ADHD I did XYZ. It's because my ADHD I struggled with this. It's because of my impulsivity issues that I struggle with money management. So it was all these things where I was like, oh... It's not that I'm a bad person. It's that my brain doesn't let me process that information the way normal a, tip, a neurotypical person does. And having the benefit of that hindsight, I think for both of us, mm -hmm. has been very enlightening. And so it was kind of just like, you know, hey, what if we just started a podcast talking about that experience? Because it's not just ADHD. I mean, that is the primary focus of our podcast, mm -hmm. but there's so many other things. I mean, dating, schooling, work issues, yeah. regular interpersonal relationships. There's so many different things where once you kind of go through it and you're on the other side of it, you're able to look back and say, okay, I understand like what my mom always told me of your fight with your friend in high school is going to feel like a big deal. But by the time you get through college, it's not going to feel that important. Or maybe even in a month, it won't be that important, even though it feels like the worst thing in the world right now. Right. It's yeah. the same thing, just kind of on like a more macro scale. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it was born out of. And I typed the draft of the text in a in my notes app and then read through it and made sure it was coherent and I wasn't missing any <laughs> words. And then I sent it to her and I was like, okay. Well, because <laughs> it was, hey, I'm thinking of starting a podcast. Do you want to do it with me? So I was kind of like, well, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Why not? What do I have to lose? But I don't think I ever would have gotten this far if you hadn't done it with me. <laughs> And I also have a tendency to, I either respond to a text immediately or four hours later. So when Katie texted me, I was on my way out for a walk and I was going to go for a long walk. So I literally read it and I was like, yo, okay. And then put my phone on, do not disturb and suck it in my pocket and left. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Don't be mad that I'm interrupting this podcast episode, which is a pretty great episode. Am I wrong? Anyway, I have spent the last two, two and a half years not doing the traveling that I love and really enjoy. This year, I decided in 2023, it's going to be different. But I also wanted to extend that to you. All the years before, I've enjoyed traveling on my own terms. But I decided that this year, I was going to open it up to the followers of the Neurodivergent Nurse. I want you to go on 
I want you to click the link in the show description and I want you to sign up to go to Spain with me from October 9th to October 15th. There's a whole itinerary. There's so much fun things that we are going to do while we are in Spain, like walking tours and sunset cruises and all of those fun things. Anyways, check every single bit of it out in the show notes. Click that link. If you can't access it, shoot me an email at theneurodivergentnurse at gmail.com. The first 10 people that sign up, there are some spots still available. You get a discount. So go ahead, do it now. There are monthly payment plans available. Let's get on this so that we can be the best of travel buddies. So like two hours goes by and she's like, "Uh, okay, it's okay. If you don't want to, I promise (laughs) you won't hurt my feelings that you don't, you don't have to. And I'm like, no, yeah, it's fine. It was a very committed answer, which is not Garrett's. No, I tend to be a little skittish with that. So (laughs) So it's a very sure and certain. Okay. And not like, yeah, let me think about it and Mm -hmm. think about like what that would mean and what I would say. No, that's what I did while I was on the walk. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah that's how we ended up here I guess yeah it was a completely impulsive text message mm-hmm. pretty much how did you yeah. come up with the name you know we were asked this yesterday and then I was thinking about it again last night and mm-hmm. um I so I used to work with a woman who when we were both doing like the tinder thing we were lamenting the state of trying to date in our late 20s early 30s and um she at the time just wanted this guy to text her good morning. And she was like, it's not like I'm asking for the world here. Like the bar is ankle high. And I just thought it was so funny. And so I kind of adopted that phrase. And then we were trying to think of like kind of a slogan or a sign off for the end of each of our episodes and something that we could tie into the name of the, the episode. So our Usually at the end of each of our episodes, we tie it into what we've talked about, but ultimately our tagline is just remember to be kind to yourself because the bar is ankle high because it's so easy to be mean to yourself, but it's also really easy to be nice to yourself. But sometimes you just kind of have to be reminded that being nice to myself doesn't mean that I have to scale Everest to deserve kindness. Mm -hmm. The the bar is ankle high. And sometimes the bar is not even ankle high. It's in hell. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes the bar is in hell. Yes. (laughs) I'm a very strong-willed and strong-minded person. And there are times there are things that I really want. And if someone may not want that the same way, or they have a different idea, even if it's a better idea, it's difficult for me. How do you two deal with that in communication with this podcast that you share? I think so far it's been suspiciously smooth almost. There's been very much a synergistic relationship going. And I think part of it is having the conversations that we have about ADHD and looking at things with this new lens we're each taking care of our strengths. Like I'm terrible when it comes to like social media outreach and putting myself out there with stuff. Katie's great. So I'll handle the planning and the more of the producing aspect and doing the editing with my spouse and what definitely needs to be cut, what needs to stay. And Katie's so much better with, hey, I reach out to this company about sponsorship. And that's something I would be horrible with. So I think a huge part of it is we've each kind of taken the ball and ran with what we're good at and trusting the other one to do it. Yeah. I would say the only real disagreement we've had is over what to name our company. (laughs) Yes. But even that just came down to me saying, I was saying that as if you were talking to like a news reporter. And uh... I said, what about this? And she looked at me and she went, no, (laughs) we just... No, we can't do that. But other than that, I don't know that we've really had too much of an issue other than like, because I am very, I'm much more willing to just throw myself out there Mm -hmm. in the social media world. I, I have had to kind of slow my roll and let Mm -hmm. you get used to the idea of, oh yeah, I'm very skittish and don't like being the face of something. Don't like having, that's, I mean, I really use a pseudonym. I don't use my real name. I use a nickname instead. I, I would say has been our biggest challenge is like bridging the gap between Katie, who is, we were joking that you're like an aggressively open book. Yeah. And me, who is the complete opposite and is like, why do you need to know my name? Yeah. And she's, <laughs> why do you need that? The diary that's like voice password protected and then <laughs> mad at you. 
<laughs> so yeah, that's just been me having to talk myself off the ledge because I I know that about her and it's not a surprise. I knew that before. Oh yeah, no. And, and usually if she tells me something, I'm like, I don't know that I'm comfortable with that. So I think a big part is we've done a really good job with communicating, communicating yeah. period, but also what we're comfortable with, what we're not comfortable with, what our vision is, goals that we have and compromising on. Not that we've had to do a lot of compromising. I don't no, think, it but... has come up. We really do mesh well together. Yeah. I think in that sense, we kind of got lucky, especially starting out with this is how I think we should do things. The end has right. never really been the discussion. No. Because I think ADHD is a spectrum and I think we have our strengths in certain areas. So yeah, we even present though, very differently yes. with the same diagnosis. And so I'm able to say like our giveaway, mm -hmm. this is what I think the giveaway should be. Make sure you're okay with it. And then I'll post. And then with producing mm -hmm. these are the episodes and then I think only one time I've taken out like a snippet of something I said where I was like mm, I don't really need to get crucified for mis mislabeling something <laughs> like I'll just take that out but other than that it's trusting that the other person is pretty good with everything and yeah. we'll copy each other on emails that mm -hmm. are relevant but for the most part we don't really need to babysit one another yeah I, no. I can trust you I think that's the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. important yeah, part of our, our dynamic yeah you sure. were talking about the specifics of communication and how well you do that collectively and together in regards to your podcast, how is it? Because a lot of times people who have ADHD, they struggle with friendships because communication is an issue. They will forget to talk to this person for a week or two weeks. And it, it's not the same because you have this podcast, but I'm sure that there could be days that could go by. How do you do that and make sure that you stay on top of that type of communication, not just on a podcast level, but as friends? I think during COVID, especially if I hadn't heard from you in a couple of days, I mm -hmm. would text you and say, hey, just making sure that you're not spiraling. Yeah. And I was usually spiraling. So that's why she had heard. <laughs> so yeah, I did, I did have to tell Garrett to stop watching the news some days. Yeah, that did happen more than once. But I also do that with a lot of my other friends. Maybe that's something to do with ADHD. But I think I've kind of cultivated my closest friends are people who don't have to hear from me every day. And mm -hmm. a like on a Facebook picture, or checking in once a month to say, hey, how's everything? How are the kids? How are you? And a quick one or two paragraph summary is enough. And we know that when we see each other, we'll still pick up where we left off. Nothing is missed or lost in translation because the reality is that I think part of what I love about my ADHD is that I don't to the extent that I can be kind and certainly when I was younger I was very obsessive with my friendships and my romantic relationships and I could get very almost hyper fixated on the person but certainly as I've gotten older it's also that thing of having a shorter memory shelf and having <laughs> the inability to really mm -hmm. juggle a thousand different intense relationships all at once has made it so that I can respect other people's need for space. And I think I've surrounded myself with people who can respect my need for space as well. Cause I, I just don't have it in me to socialize that much every day. Yeah. I think for like, for me too, the podcast has helped a lot. We've done so much in-depth research of so many different things having to do with ADHD that it's made me more aware of things that I do and habits that I have and ways that I approach things. And I think it's allowed me to, communicate that a little bit more honestly with people in my life. Mm. I have a tendency to get overwhelmed and then shut down mm -hmm. and I'm very quiet and don't reach out to people, don't talk to people and regroup on my own. And I've gotten better about being able to communicate that with people and be like, hey, sorry, I have X, Y, and Z going on and I'm just overwhelmed. I'll follow up with you in a couple weeks or whatever it is. I think that I've gotten better at communicating that instead of maybe before I would have gotten overwhelmed and kind of snippy with somebody. I don't want to be snippy. I'm just completely overwhelmed and don't know what to do with myself. So I think between being back in therapy, realizing that I needed to be on medication, I'm on Zoloft now and it's made a huge difference working on the podcast. Those are all things it's caused a lot of personal growth in me that I think has made me a better friend to people in my life too. Here, we were talking earlier about how you're the person who's a little bit more skittish whenever yes. the, the inception of this podcast and the idea came about, what made you want to just go for it? Well, Katie and I have fun doing stuff together. We always laugh a lot. So I knew like there would be that aspect where we would both be having fun, but I've always been a huge 
huge podcast fan myself. So I mean, when I'm going on long walks and doing dishes and cleaning and driving, I'm listening to podcasts that I love. So I was like, man, it would be really cool to kind of have this side thing that we could do. And I think also we're in our early to mid thirties. We're kind of at that age where you've been in a job for maybe 10, 15 years or on a career path for 10 or 15 years. And you start to get that itch. Am I doing the right thing? Is this creatively making me happy? Is this something that I'm having all these ideas about? Or do I need to find something else that's more fulfilling to me? So I think that I felt like I had something that I was kicking around and I'd consider going back to school. And it was all these different ideas. I don't want to put myself into debt to do something. I don't want to have to totally overextend myself while trying to work full time. So I think that this kind of met a lot of needs at the same time. I was on board, but it took me a little bit before I was comfortable with the vision for it. Mm -hmm. And when we really landed on what we wanted to do, but also that hindsight and knowing, I guess with this lens, we've been looking at things with that something doesn't have to be perfect at first. We can work on it and we Mm -hmm. can kind of kick it around and chew on it a bit and we're eventually going to land on what works. So I think not having the expectation of something being perfect right out of the gates too. Which is a really scary thing for a lot of us with ADHD. You feel like you're a perfectionist, especially when it comes to careers or people's perception of you in general. We talked about this in one of our episodes. I don't remember which one. Whatever it was, I think it was time management maybe, our episode on that. But when we were doing that research is when I realized that what I was billing as perfectionism was actually poor time management because of my ADHD. And one of the reasons that I really asked for an assessment and a diagnosis was because my day job is extremely deadline oriented. I only do legal appeals. And if you miss that deadline, you are up a creek without a paddle, like the end. You and and the other people who are depending on you. Right. Well, yeah. And I work for an agency, so it's public funds that I'm responsible for and potentially responsible for wasting if I don't get that appeal in on time. So I was finding myself pushing up against these deadlines and filing things at 5 p.m. multiple days a week and not because it was a complicated issue or because I was super busy or overwhelmed, but because I was not managing my time well and I wasn't focusing until two o'clock in the afternoon. And then at that point, I had that pressure and that adrenaline rush of the procrastination that was getting me through. And I was able to bill it through law school, through the first eight years of my my career as, oh, I'm just a perfectionist. I just want to make sure it's perfect. That's not true. I was... <laughs> I was just watching butterflies go by the window. I was just in la la land. Like, oh, I'm just going to redo my budget for the next three months in the middle of my workday. Sure. Why not? I don't know. That's just what my brain told me was a priority or I'm going to go shopping for some new hiking boots because I want to go hiking this year, four or five months from now. But right now it's a priority. When we covered that topic is when I really came to grips with the fact that no, I'm actually not a perfectionist. And we've had this discussion on our podcast as well, where I'm offensively optimistic. I refuse to fail. I am going to do it. I'm going to Elwood's the hell out of it. (laughs) And I set my mind to it and that's what's going to happen. So the question of how it's going to happen, I can figure out along the way, but it's definitely going to happen. I'm going to get to that finish line. Just watch. It's less about perfectionism for me and really comes down to, do I want it enough to go for it? That's really what motivates me is how bad I want it. And I think what I love about the podcast is that there isn't really a perfectionism streak for it because we're actively learning in each episode. Yeah. And I think that it probably is a good mantra for us to end episodes with because it kind of reminds us yeah. sometimes too. There's been times where we've had to be like, okay, we're not racing anybody. We do <laughs> at least once a month. I text Katie and I'm like, we don't have a boss. Yeah. (laughs) And I know me personally, I probably got over a lot of the perfectionism when I left the private sector. Mm. I think being in private sector, there is, it's just a different animal. And I think that working in the public sector has been really good for me, forcing me to have a work-life balance. Yeah. And I think all of those things, going back to therapy, starting a medication, this podcast, hitting my thirties, I think all of those things have really kind of helped me unravel that perfectionism pressure that I was putting on myself that nobody else was putting on me for sure. And it's such a natural creative outlet to have this podcast. I think that's probably why Mm -hmm. I keep coming back to it and I haven't lost my interest in it. Yeah. Which was for sure a concern. I think if I had to do this alone, I would have lost interest. Which, and I think that's part of why I was so unconcerned. Because, all right, worst case scenario, we lose interest and we don't do it. True. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Accurate. 
I think it's so great to have a co-host because you have that accountability partner. Yeah. Because so often, even with mine, I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't put out an episode in a month and I've recorded a couple, but I haven't done it. Whose deadline am I trying to get to? It's it's tough. It can be very, Mm -hmm. very tough. Because I am a deadline driven person, but I don't lose anything if I, or if I don't put it out on time or if I don't put it out at all, it hurts no one. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And we've lucked out too. if there's periods of time where Katie's really focusing a lot on social media and outreach to different sponsors. And like when we were getting the LLC stuff set up, I then took over and did a bunch of episodes Mm -hmm. so that she wasn't doing the research. We've also been able to kind of balance it that way too where if one of us is focusing on something then the other one will pick up with something else and and kind of take the reins we are lucky and the fact that we don't have to do our own editing I'll just know helps for now oh. <laughs> Yeah, I ended up hiring someone. I don't blame that is the bane of my podcast existence is editing. (laughs) I don't even like listening to myself. So when people ask me to be on their podcast, I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go because they have to talk to me. (laughs) I feel so bad for them, you know? (laughs) Yeah, you're a real tyrant. (laughs) (laughs) Since you have been recording your podcast, what is the most interesting thing that you have learned through it? I know my favorite, favorite moment where Katie had a revelation. I'm interested if it's, what was it? (laughs) That was a bad day for me. Uh, We both had moments where we were covering something and you see the other person kind of having an existential crisis in the corner of the room. Like, oh my God, I do that. (laughs) So yeah, we had generally when we, especially when we first started, it's not so much that anymore, but when we first started it, we had the the core ADHD symptoms from the DSM Mm -hmm. and we split them up to be like, okay, I really struggle with time management. So I'll do the episode on that. Theoretically, the idea being that the person researching it would have more anecdotal reference to supply their storytelling in the episodes and Garrett <laughs> had said well I have I've always struggled with sleep and I can't relate I struggle with sleep more recently but that's because of an experience that I had not because of my ADHD as a child as a young adult I've always slept through the night and I had no issues with sleep so Garrett was like yeah I'll just do sleeping like I'll do sleep because I I have to have these nine things done in ridiculous specific order <laughs> My mom calls me a parakeet because I like have to sleep in complete darkness. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I like having a fan on, but like whatever. She's doing her sleep episode and she talks about intrusive sleep and she started talking about it and she's like, well, the theta waves are da 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 da. And I was like, could you just say that one more time? <laughs> And she repeats it and she's like, so you just heinously fall asleep. It's not narcolepsy. You just fall asleep. Like you just get so, so tired. You can't stay awake. And I almost passed away from just the shock of (laughs) realizing that I deal with that problem weekly, if not bi-weekly at work, where I'll hit a point in the afternoon where I just cannot keep my eyes open. I am bored to tears and falling asleep from it. And I've struggled with it my whole life. Mm -hmm. I did it in high school. I did it in college. I did it in law school. I've done it my whole life. Well, turns out it's a freaking ADHD thing. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. I can't go to movies because I'll do that. I finally stop. That's when I fall asleep if I will stop doing things. So yeah, I get in a movie theater and then I can't do anything but stare at a screen and the lights turn down low, unconscious. It's a waste (laughs) of money for anyone that goes with me. My mom is like that. (laughs) Yeah, I think, and I think for me, I think I do have the intrusive sleep. The description of falling out of a chair, I was like, I don't have that. And then the more we talked about it, I was like, oh no, I do struggle with getting really tired. I think for me, the real pivotal topic that we covered I would say both emotional dysregulation and when we did the rejection sensitivity yeah um because it was always something about myself that I could kind of never put my finger on Mm -hmm. this isn't an anxiety thing I just never knew why I was that way and just always felt like I was feeling things so much more intensely than other people and I've had people describe me as intense which then makes you super self-conscious because I'm not trying to be intense it's just how I am yeah (laughs) right Yeah. So I think that was really validating for me. And it also just made me, again, allowed me to work with it instead of against it. Mm -hmm. So seeing when it was happening and being able to be like, okay, let's unpack it a little bit. Why are you feeling so triggered by this thing that really shouldn't be triggering? And I think that's helped me a lot. In my podcast room on half of the wall I have words that either I have called myself through the years or other people have called me and nice words or mean words no not good things but then the other half it looks like it's 
it's being painted over. Oh, um, cool. And then I also put like my degrees and awards and certifications and stuff over those words as well. But intense is one of the big ones that I put on there because mm-hmm. I certainly called myself that. And I'm sure other people throughout mm-hmm. the years of knowing me thought she is such an intense person. Oh, I'm like, sure I'm so <laughs> like rigid yeah. sometimes with the intensity yeah. that I have on mm-hmm. things that I know. Or passionate. I, that's on the, that's yes. up there too. And it's not in a positive way that is passionate. Right, yes. Yeah, that works right. up there too. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I was always just like, yeah, but it's an important thing. <laughs> But it, but it matters. <laughs> the other thing that I remember, which I didn't realize until like a week later, but with emotional dysregulation, that it can be positive feelings too, not mm. just an anger outburst. And then I was, oh, I, I do have that. <laughs> oh, that is something I deal with. <laughs> that is me. And then every time we get somebody signing up for a Patreon, I do like a high kick and completely. She means like a literal high kick. Yeah. Like she... I have a black belt. So what am I going to use it for if not to celebrate? Which <laughs> literally came over to my desk and high kicked. <laughs> We have a new Patreon and I was like, you just got to like really. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. One of our Patreon subscribers is a staffer at the state Senate and is working on a bill jacket for expanding healthcare options for adults with ADHD. That is fantastic. Um, And has used like the research from our podcast to help support her arguments to her Senator for why that is an important thing. So that's really exciting. Yeah, I thought when Katie gave me that information, it was a hypothetical. <laughs> and yesterday she was like, no, that's not hypothetical. That's happening. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then she was like, thank you for not letting me name the company what I wanted to name it because that would have been <laughs> to do a speech in front of the Senate and say, we'll tell you off air what, what you wanted to name it. It was not it good. Was bad. <laughs> it was a bad choice. <laughs> having to get introduced next to Stephen Colbert. Like, it would have been people. my professional shame if we had named her. <laughs> my, my mom listened to our first couple episodes and was like, you're, you're swearing a lot, Katie. It's And I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, you've met me before. <laughs> you do know me. <laughs> Bless your yeah, heart. I feel like we've heard that a little bit. She's like, it's kind of explicit. Yeah. <laughs> And always that box is like, is this made for children? I was like, nope. Mm -mm. (laughs) This is not. Yeah. Our episodes get posted to YouTube. So there's subtitles and I have to go in and manually say whether it's been on TV and if it's for all audiences. And I'm like, I mean, I guess technically, but you shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) It's not nudity, but. (laughs) Right. I've got a friend who's got a son who's three and she started listening and he heard my voice. And then he was like, is she here? Oh. Where is she? Can I? And he wanted to listen because he could hear my voice. She was like, no, no, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. She's not here and you can't listen. If you guys had to give advice to other people who have ADHD, a couple of tokens to take away for doing something that may not exactly be what they've always done. It's not necessarily based on their career or just like starting this podcast that would have helped you or now looking back through that lens where you're like, yeah, this was, this was great motivation or great encouragement. What would you share with the listeners? I think allowing yourself to feel scared. Mm, Um, I think that I definitely have a tendency to kind of bully myself a little bit. Yeah. Just a smidge, just a little bit, very self-deprecating. So I think just allowing myself just because I'm feeling, it doesn't mean I'm always going to feel that way. And it doesn't mean that it's not going to go well, but you're allowed to be scared about something or upset about something and processing that first so that I can get onto the planning part. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. I think that I use my fear or whatever fear I might have over something to fuel me, especially if I can sit down and say, no, I have these skills. I can use my voice. I know how to research and write notes to things. I know how to use social media. I can figure out how to set up a website or find a hosting platform or whatever, and research what I need to research to figure this all out. So on paper, I can do this. I might as well use the fear of failure to force me to never fail. It is a little bit of that perfectionism thing, but I think it's more like that moment 
in Legally Blonde where she's like, I'll show you how valuable I can be. And she's standing in line in the Playboy bunny costume at the Apple store, getting her laptop and getting her life together and proving everybody wrong. Not only is she going to do it, she's going to do it her way and she's going to kick your ass when she does it. And so will I. There's nothing about me that says I can't do something. So there's no reason and being able to take that step back and being able to have each other mm -hmm. to kind of talk ourselves off of that ledge, should it come to that, mm -hmm. has been very helpful. Even if it's not so like, hey, I'm spiraling because I don't think that this is going to work. But it's it's never, I don't think, has been as pointed as that. But it has been, what do you think about X, Y, Z? I'm thinking this. And then the other one of us can come in and say, no, I think that's wrong because it'll work for these four reasons, or our partners are super supportive as well. Mm -hmm. So we have our partners as well to do that. But I think it it has been helpful to use that fear as fuel. It doesn't have to cripple you. It can power you mm -hmm. and just go for it, you know? And like, like not taking no for an answer, I think also. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a prime example, we have our sponsor, Com Strips, which was like Katie reached out to on a whim, like, hey, I'm going to send them an email and it, it worked out. Versus there was another company that we both really liked that we use for cosmetics that we reach out to mm. that was like, no, we're not interested. And I could tell you were like really bummed about it. And I, was like, <laughs> I was pissed bummed. <laughs> Fine. We don't need you anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I said to Katie, the first no we've gotten this whole time. Yeah. I mean, like we definitely, I think we each had people in our lives that were like, you're going to do what? Oh, for sure. How, how was that going to go? Why though? Aren't you yeah. employed? Did you lose your <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Are you sure that's a good idea? So I think not listening to that and not listening to that inner dialogue of my anxiety spirals that sometimes are external instead of internal. Um, <laughs> I get that. <laughs> oh, I do think if either of us were doing this individually, we probably still wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. But I think doing it together and kind of tugging each other along when the other one's unsure has yeah kept us going. I think it's fair to say, I've heard a lot. I mean, I'm not married, but a lot of people will say, oh, marriage is 50-50. And I think that it probably averages out to that, but there are times where it's 60-40 or 80-20. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that goes for friendships as well. Mm -hmm. So there are times where I just can't give as much. I've got mm -hmm. something going on. I'm traveling. I'm out of town or you're out of town. And it's just a matter of knowing and giving that person the space also to recharge so that they can come back and, mm -hmm. yes. and yeah, be here. I think and, the holidays was the prime example. Like mm -hmm. we're at a point where we, we were really gaining momentum and gaining listeners. And it was like, I think we need to take a few weeks off. So we put up like some Patreon episodes and just took some downtime and didn't record for a few weeks. And we, we tend to stay, I almost did it again. We tend to <laughs> oh stay ahead God. with our recording schedules that we have a buffer for ourselves, which is my insistence. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I'm getting I, used to it. You know, she is. six months later. <laughs> yes. It's only taken that long. And I think that that is also helpful that we're getting better as we get older at anticipating, you know what I know, Thanksgiving to New Year's is going to be a shit show and I'm going to be overwhelmed personally and work's going to be busy and this is going to be busy. So maybe the best thing to do since listenership is going to be down during the holidays anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> is we just need to kick back a little bit and give, give ourselves a break. Because I think we also were starting to burn ourselves out because we were just throwing ourselves so much into it that it, we felt like we were always working because we were at work working. We were working on it at home. We were working on it on the weekends, recording on the weekends. I was helping edit yes. on the weekend. So it was like working seven days a week. Right. Um, and I think we just both realized, oh, we need to build in time off for ourselves and downtime and rest. And Which my therapist did warn me about same. in August. So did mine. <laughs> so did mine. I was like, okay, so just make sure you really like structure. So maybe you should schedule time. <laughs> Which to be fair, I do have my out of office on our yes. shared calendar every yes. week for Wednesdays and Sundays. I don't respect that. No. Nope. But on Wednesdays I do. <laughs> And I do think once we got to the point where we were doing less setup, now that we're more in a flow and we have things a little bit more established, it's easier to block off time. Yeah, for sure. We were but also double recording on weekends too. That was a lot. That was a lot. And I, I do think that's something if any of your listeners are thinking of starting their own podcast, that's certainly something to consider is that it 
will for sure take you way longer to record than you think it will. Yeah. You normally we're recording on Saturday mornings and we'll record a Patreon episode, one at least, and then our regular episode. Then those have to be edited and mixed and then uploaded. And then I listen to them and come up with the names and I write the summaries for everything and create the social media squares, handle the social media. So it's very easy for those things to bleed through if you're not saying, no, I'm just tired and I need to wash my clothing. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) I have to do that. I have to prioritize that. And honestly, therapy has been really helpful in helping sort that out. Yeah. Just to set up those systems and those routines because we do thrive in structure as much as we might fight against it. Oh, I don't fight. I love it. (laughs) As much as I might fight against it. (laughs) As much as Katie will fight it. I I do do Katie. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I do thrive in it. And so having Sundays are the day where... My whole apartment is cleaned, every room, all of my laundry gets put away, whether it put away is just in the hamper or actually into the dresser drawers when it's cleaned. I clean everything so that I'm starting the week with a fresh slate. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, then I can do podcast stuff. But I have to take care of my house, my space first, Mm -hmm. because I know if I don't, my whole week will just feel like catch up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you're behind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It (laughs) mustard. (laughs) (laughs) It just feels so much more chaotic if I don't take the time to really just prioritize those basic needs, which is something that I've really had to learn to do and having the diagnosis has really helped me say, no, I actually have to think about setting that boundary for myself Mm -hmm. and make sure that I make a scheduled time each week to clean and to meal prep or do my grocery shopping so that it's the same every week and I have that routine. And if it has to change for whatever reason, a barbecue or something, then I can do that. But generally speaking, my time to clean is my time to clean. My time to relax is also Mm -hmm. my time to relax and finding those kind of healthy outlets. Yeah, definitely building in that time to rest. And I think now that we have two jobs, yeah, (laughs) it's one of those, it used to be, oh yeah, I'm just going to do this after work. Mm -hmm. And now it has to be a little bit more deliberate. So I think definitely it's made us more conscious of the importance of setting aside time that is just for Sometimes I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like exercising. I'm just going to take a long shower and do a face mask and try and feel human again Mm -hmm. Um, because the burnout is possible and sneaks up on you for sure. Absolutely. It's hard to not feel like you have to earn rest. Yes. And that is something that I still struggle with. I mean, there are times I can get caught in a burnout loop where then I'm in that place where I can't rest. It doesn't matter how tired I am. I have to get it done. I have to do this. I have to clean. I have to do laundry. And sometimes I'll call my boyfriend and say, hey, can you come over and help me do my laundry? Because I have a lot to do and I just need somebody to do with me so that I'm Mm -hmm. less overwhelmed. And then it's done in two and a half hours instead of eight. Actually, another one of those, like we were talking about the mind-blowing existential mm-hmm. moments that we had I realized that all I'm a very hobby based person there's like a oh, lot yeah. of things that I do you did panic and we were talking about it and I was like oh my god everything that I do for fun or for relaxation has a goal and I looked at Katie I was like I don't do I not know how to have fun because <laughs> I realized that even if I'm doing this artistic thing I'm doing it as a gift for someone mm-hmm. or even if I'm doing this it's so that I'm also exercising or if I'm doing this it's because I I really am going to give it to this person or I'm doing it for this occasion so I think that that is also that's been another moment that was you kind did of yeah when you realize that you only had productivity based yes uh, downtime hobbies yeah which is uh, oxymoron yes but now we have this yes which isn't exactly productivity based I'd say like we don't do it with a a set like oh, this episode will get 10,000 downloads or something crazy. No. But when that happens, I'll be really good. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I will explode. I'll do so many high kicks. Yeah. I'll be and on we, the Rockettes. And really, like, it's been so steady, and I think it's grown faster than I expected it would. That's Katie. I tell her that all the time. <laughs> it's a good thing you use social media, because if it was up to me, we'd have five weekly listeners. <laughs> Speaking of social media, Katie, where can people find y'all? We're most active on Instagram. Our handle is at the bar is ankle high. I cross post our Instagram posts to Facebook, but if you want to engage with us and get prompt replies to your comments or messages, Instagram is the best way to find us. We're also on Twitter and TikTok and our handles on both of those platforms are at the bar is ankle high. Our episodes get automatically posted and shared to Twitter 
Um, I'm way more often on Instagram and it's a much more fun app for me to use to talk with people. I think it's just, it's just more fun and I can send a gift back to somebody if they've messaged us and refer them to a link or whatever. And it's just a way easier interface for me. And That's I also feel like the it's only not as platform angry. I'm on. <laughs> it's not as angry. You're no. right. Yeah. <laughs> there's not, not, there's not so much anger there on Instagram. Yeah. That's no. why I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've only gotten a few weird messages from some random accounts and, you know, the bots, of course, but whatever. Bots are living their best life. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Otherwise, all the links to our social medias are on our website at thebarisanklehigh.com. And we have a listen link there, too. So you can find us on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And you mentioned Patreon. Let's not finish this episode without, if they want more of you than what you offer, where can they get more? Yeah, we have a Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high. We have three tiers. There's toe rings, which is $2 a month. Anklets is $5 a month. And uh, Limbo Champions is $10 a month. (laughs) All levels get our monthly fake horoscopes that I write. They're fully fake. I'm not a trained astrologist. (laughs) For a while last year, Gemini started a cult. So each month there was a new installment of what was going on with Gemini's cult. (laughs) The Anklet and Limbo Champion tiers get our bonus episodes, which we call Dysfunction Junction. So that's every, a lot of our bonus episodes that we've released for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Those Mm -hmm. are Patreon preview bonus episodes. And our Limbo Champion subscribers also get ad-free episodes and they'll get the video copy of our our interview with you that we recorded yeah, oh yesterday. Boy. So. Otherwise, it's growing slowly but surely. It is. I'm really excited about Patreon. I think it's going to really take off and we'll be able to offer a lot more stuff. And it's us without structure, so... <laughs> we have to record those before our episodes so that yes. we can get all the tangents out ahead of time before we have to focus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you like the weird stuff that we talk about, yes. then that is the place for you. <laughs> um, or if you hate ads, also the place for yes. you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank y'all so much for taking the time to be on the Neurodivergent Nurse Day. I have thoroughly enjoyed today and yesterday and getting to know you both even more. Hopefully we can do this again sometime in the future because oh, I would love to have y'all back on and hang out some more. Oh, yes. We would love anytime. That. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. This has been lovely. You're a dream to work with every oh, time thanks. we talk. So <laughs> if you enjoyed today's episode, I would love it if you would go and leave a five-star review. And if you want to contribute and support the Neurodivergent Nurse, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the Neurodivergent Nurse. And there you can get bonus episodes, daily ADHD tips sent straight to you, worksheets for issues that you may be struggling with when it comes to ADHD, and a free ticket to my monthly webinar. Go sign up so that you can join my neurodivergent family.